Welcome to Rework, a podcast by 37 Signals about the better way to work and run your business. I'm your host, Kimberly Rhodes. It's been more than seven months since Twitter's purchase by the always controversial Elon Musk. And since that time, a reported 80% of the company has been let go, bringing the Twitter workforce from just under 8,000 employees to around 1,500. With all that turmoil, there are many who believed that Twitter would fail completely or just stop working. But Twitter's still up, which begs the question, how many people do you really need to run your company effectively? Here to talk about all things Twitter and how many employees you really need, 37 Signals co-founders Jason Fried and David Heinemeyer Hansen. Guys, I know you guys are both active on Twitter. When all this started, not only like the purchase, but all the firings, were you guys on Twitter's going to fail team or like, ah, they'll be fine? <laughs> Um, well, I think our, you know, our fundamental point of view in general is that you need less than you think. Now, I don't know what that is and every company is different and, you know, we don't know the inner workings of, of, of other companies, but I think it's safe to say Twitter didn't need 8,000 people and probably didn't need 7,000 or 6,000 or 5,000 or 4,000 or 3,000. And I don't know where they actually landed. I'm not sure what they have now, but it turns out it's, it's still up. It's still working. Um, now people can have their point of view on what's on Twitter. Fine, that's their thing, but the system works. And I think it's a, it's a really wonderful um, uh, example of, uh, I mean, again, you don't wanna look at this and like, there, was, there were human casualties here, obviously. I mean, not casualty casualties, but people lost their jobs. That's not obviously anything anyone really wants to happen. But I think at the company systems level, you can look at it and go, you don't need that many people to run something like this. And that's the lesson, not lay off your whole staff. That's not the lesson. Um, not that, you know, people weren't doing work or whatever they were asked to do, but that you just don't need quite as much as you think. And we have a company of 80 people. We've run this company. Um, I think I would say pretty damn well over the past 24 years, um, with a relatively small staff. This is the, the largest we've ever been, but I was actually talking to some guy yesterday, um, who works at another company and their engineering group is 125 people, right? And you look at what they're doing and look at what we're doing and, and our whole company is 80 people. And you just wonder like, why do they have 125? And that's just a small portion of their company. Their company has actually thousands of people. And we just look at that and we just don't, I don't think we get it. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to us. So I don't know, that's my general point of view. I think that the big takeaway here is you need less than you think. And um, the, 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 I think the deeper thing is as you're building a company, the way I look at this is this is a lesson for people who are building companies also which is don't hire more people than you need. Don't get ahead of yourself. Don't hire in anticipation of pain, but instead hire when it hurts and keep things as, ta- as tight and small as you can for as long as you can. I think that's probably the better way to, to build the right habits. I'd go even more aggressive and say- I, I know you would, so I, I, left, I left the opening for you. <laughs> um, Twitter was morbidly obese as a company. It was morbidly obese in comparison to the amount of data that was flowing through the system and the velocity with which it was evolving the platform. And that perhaps more than anything is the real shocker. It's not that you could take the Twitter that was and operated with 1500 people instead of 8000 is that you can take the Twitter that was basically barely evolving, barely changing anything and turn it into uh, startup e feeling thing again. I mean, not a true startup, but they're trying things at a vastly different velocity than they were trying things before. They're introducing new features. They're changing things um, with such a smaller staff. And I think this really puts the point on not only can you get away with less, but you can go faster if you're lighter. And I think this is one of the things we've held true for so long. When you compare what we do with the staff we have on something like Basecamp to a bunch of the competitors we have in the space, whether you Asana, Monday, or ClickUp, or any of these other very large companies that have well over a thousand employees, and you look at the comparison, you go like, I don't even know how, and of course I do know how, is that weight itself is sort of exponential in terms of slowing down your capacity to move forward. It is so much harder to move forward quickly when you have way more than you need. If you have a 
a, a group of people who are moving with provisions for thousands of people, of course they're going to move slower than a group of people of 80 <laughs> packing relatively light to where they need to go. So seeing that contrast, I think, is is just really been revolutionary. And what I appreciate about this experiment is that it's the type of experiment we so rarely, if ever get to see play out in real life. Normally, you'll have these arguments, oh, could they be smaller? Could they be bigger? Are they just right? And it'd just be arguments. It'd just be us going back and forth like, oh, is it the one thing or is it the other thing? In some ways, similar to what the remote discussion was like pre-pandemic. People would go like, well, we can't go remote. You can't, uh, all the creativity. And then you're forced to deal with an experiment that ran in reality. Like, are there anyone left who is still claiming that Twitter needs 8,000 people as of May 31st, 2023? If they are, man, they're doubling down on a bad bet. I'll tell you that. Um, reality has simply shown what was possible. And that's what's so fascinating about this whole thing. Um, again, as Jason says, it is such, it's almost difficult to have that discussion because all the other stuff is going on because Musk is such a polarizing character because people actually did lose their jobs. But if you take the last point, losing your job, I do think there's a worthwhile discussion there to be had about were, were these actually good jobs? Or if you're working inside an organization that's barely moving, barely shipping, barely doing anything, like are these good jobs for sort of the individual, for the company, for the industry, for everything else? Um, I think there's an interesting discussion there to be had. I'd argue that a bunch of people inside those organizations had what David Graeber would define as bullshit jobs. That whether they came to work or did not come to work had no impact whatsoever on whether Twitter did well or didn't do well, whether customers were served or not served, or whether the whole thing was working. And I'd say the reason I say that with such pointed uh, determination is that we had someone work at our company who used to work at, uh, at Twitter for a while. This is years back, which goes to illustrate how deeply this uh, rabbit hole is. Uh, this was a designer who had worked at Twitter, I think for two and a half years. That's like a fair amount of time. Shipped nothing, zero. Not a single thing that person had worked on ever made it into production. And this was not just a single individual working in like a closet somewhere by themselves. This was an individual working on a team with other people. It is so hard for me to get into like, how can you get to that point that you can have someone work at your company for two and a half years with other people and never ship anything? And once you knew an anecdote like that, which correlating it with other anecdotes seemed to be representative of the kind of company that Twitter was, you go like, yeah, I can totally see how they had six and a half thousand too many people. Well, and if you think about it, I mean, I'm not a huge Twitter expert, but I don't really can't think of a lot of updates that have happened in the last couple of years, just in general. It's not like the product has changed or improved drastically where that employee count makes sense. Yeah, I think that that's the thing that David just said that really, really hits, I think, which is they've made more changes with fewer people in the past six months than they apparently had uh, in, 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 the, in the previous six or in the previous two years with you know four times the amount of people. That's gotta say something. And we talk about this, I think it was in Rework or maybe it was in Getting Real, this concept of less mass. That, that, that in the physical world, um, the more mass of an object, the more energy it takes to change its direction. And this is true in companies as well. The more people you have, the more management you have, the more entanglement you have, the more dependencies you have, the more mass you have. And it's just a lot harder to move that mass around. When you have less mass, you can move quickly. And this is actually a conversation I was having, having with this guy yesterday when he was telling me like he's a little frustrated because things aren't quite moving as quickly as, as, as he wished. And I go, yeah, it's hard to move around bigger organizations. I mean, the advantage to being small primarily is speed. That is the primary actual advantage it's speed. Um, and you almost get that. You could look, three people can sit on their hands for three years also. You, you can go slow, but the, you, you tend not to. You tend to just move. It's just like the natural state of things and the nature of things when you have a small organization. So that's what you get for free. And then you lose that as you get bigger. 
you get heavier and slower. That's just physics and it's business. And uh, I think I think what Twitter showed is that so far, at least, is that by taking the the load off, essentially, they're able to move again. And whether or not you like the movements, whatever, but like they're moving. And I think as an observer of business and, 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 and experiments, like David says, it's very hard to find these things play out in the real world to actually just sit back and observe objectively. Like this is interesting to see a company get cut back so quickly and then move so fast and try things out in the public realm. Very, very rare. And so as a student of this stuff, I think everyone should be paying very close attention to it, regardless of whether or not they, what they think of the owner or what's on the platform. Um, but there's, there's a lot of instructive uh, outcomes here. It's pretty interesting. And I think what is also fascinating about the changes was it was a renegotiation of what Twitter was going to be as a company, what tasks it was going to have. And one of the things that um, Musk did, perhaps one of the most controversial things, was he said, we're just not going to have a, an enormous content moderation team. Like that whole regime of how the content is being picked over or suppressed or banned or whatever, we're going to take a different direction on that. And that's going to need far fewer people, which in itself was a experiment, gamble, wildly contested in all sorts of ways. Um, but when I look at the Twitter I use today, and I, I do use it differently, like it's, it's, it's fascinating personally to witness this because I've had such a mixed relationship with Twitter. I've used it so much for so many years. I think I have 65,000 tweets or something completely perverse since 2007 or whatever. And then in the past uh, uh, two, three years, I've totally changed how I use Twitter and, and, and use it to some extent, far less, um, in part because I don't actually like the dynamics of much of that kind of social media and what we get from that, what the algorithm optimizes for. It optimizes for engagement and what's the easiest way to extract engagement It is through rage and drama and animosity. Um, so you, you can have that perspective of what the system is. And then as Jason say, just look at it from a systems thinking perspective and go, this is one of the most fascinating novel business case studies of the entire tech history, of the entire history of, of, of everything that we've been doing, working with the internet. How often have we gotten an opportunity to see something like this? I compared it to when Steve Jobs returned to Apple in 1997. Um, shortly after he returned, Apple fired 4,100 employees. One of the reasons why they fired that many employees was that Apple, or Steve Jobs came back in, took stock of what they were doing and say, we're just doing way too much stuff. We're going slower towards the destination. We want to be a top tier computing brand and whatever by having all this stuff. I remember famously him doing this thing. Do you know what? We need four things. We need a laptop for consumer, and for um, business, we need a desktop for consumer and for business. And then he methodically started filling these things out. We got the iBook, that was the laptop for consumer. We got the MacBook, that was the laptop for business. We got the iMac, the computer for um, for, for personal, and I forget what the thing was for, uh, for business. Before that, Apple had all sorts of products, all sorts of things they were chasing. And he's like, no, 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 we gotta cut it back to four things. Then later, of course, once the machinery was fixed, you can start adding back up. But while it's drifting, while it's rudderless, while it's not moving in the right direction, the number one thing you need to do is get back to less. You could build it back up. I mean, Apple today makes a lot of different products. Some would say perhaps too many. But now they have this well-oiled machine to do it, which is also evident in the, in the employee base. When we talk about like mass, Apple has a lot of mass. I don't know what the latest employee count is. Um, I think it's over 200,000 if you count all the employees at the, at the stores as well. But they have a machine where that works, right? Twitter had no machine. It had a headless chicken show for years. Um, this is one of the few times I'd quote Mark Zuckerberg, where his assessment of Twitter was, it was a clown car that fell into a gold mine. Well, one of the other things I think we're seeing for the first time or getting to you know, kind of observe, observe is 
competitors coming out of the woodwork, people who are like, oh, Twitter's going to fail, so I'm going to spin up my own Twitter alternative. I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. I know you guys have thoughts about competitors and imitation and, and those things. So, well, I mean, I think it's great that people are making new things. Like, this is good for everybody. Whether or not things stick around, the time will tell, and there's no way to know now. But it's wonderful to see new life breathed into an area that was sort of become, had become very, very stagnant. I mean, Twitter really is an incredibly unique product. There was no competition for Twitter at all, really. I mean, nothing else really works like it or had worked like it. And now there's a few things. Great. I think it's great. And uh, so it, 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 if, <laughs> if for, for people who hate what happened to Twitter, well, it spawns some competition. It breathes some oxygen on the fire, and now there's more of it, and now there's more things, more experiments happening. This is a healthy, incredibly healthy outcome, ultimately. So we'll see how it all lands, but so far, so good. Couldn't agree more. I particularly like the experiment that's been running with Macedon because it's a new way of running it, a bunch of individual little um, instances that are linked together, but uh, it distributes the content moderation strategy and different instances can try different things. And one of the reasons why I like that experiment so much is because it proves that Twitter has a fundamentally hard problem. That there was not just a clear, easy solution that someone could come up with and like, ta-da, it's all fixed and now everyone is happy with this uh, town square for the conversation. No, actually Mastodon felt, found out that if you distribute the content moderation powers, suddenly you uh, prop up a bunch of people who get drunk on power very quickly and those instances are no better actually. The other thing I think is interesting is at least that's where we are now and it's obviously very hard to predict where it ultimately ends. Competing with Twitter by making like a marginally better Twitter, I think is dead on arrival. Now, lots of people are trying and I could totally be wrong, but I think we've seen it enough times in the technology industry that you don't unseat something like Twitter by being like 5% better, 10% better. No, no, you have to be radically not just better, but different. If you look at the whole history of all these platforms, the only one in the past, whatever, 10 plus years that have truly shaken things up is TikTok. And TikTok was radically better at the one thing it focused on, this algorithmic um, serving up a short videos, right? No one else had that. And it's this asymmetry in the competition that you might look at why is, Twi or why is TikTok actually competition for Facebook or even Twitter? Well, it is because it's a social media and people spend their time there instead. So I would put my money on if something's gonna unseat Twitter, it's gonna be like a TikToking like thing of what happened to Facebook. It is not Mastodon or Truth Social or there's like a handful of other ones out there now. Um, and I think you Instagram's coming out with theirs. Yes, and... exactly. And I think what you see is for a lot of people who passionately dislike Elon Musk, who passionately dislike Twitter, they're still as addicted to the original platform as ever. You'd think when you have that much grievances built up, you have so much motivation to actually jump ship. And it just illustrates the hard part of a social media platform is not sort of the features, it's the network. The other thing is, it just, it proves that this stuff is hard. Product market fit is hard. Um, all the geniuses that are, that are saying he's doing it wrong and they're doing it wrong and they say, okay, now you do it. It's actually pretty damn hard. And some of the people doing it have a lot of money and, and a lot of history. It's hard. This is a really hard thing to do. Um, and uh, this is true in any, in any industry. And it's, it, it, gets, it only gets harder when you basically make kind of the same thing, which is sort of what David is saying. Like, all these things are basically kind of the same thing. There's not enough of a reason for mass numbers of people to jump ship for kind of sort of the same thing. Um, and I think they also have a problem, which is just shows the network part, which is David was David was saying is like, it's, it's in, it, so I wrote about this years ago, this idea of the intimidating zero zero is so back when we started publishing years and years and years and years ago, there were no follower accounts. There was, I didn't know how many people read our blog. You don't know anything because we didn't, there was no tracking. Everything now has numbers on it. And so when you're starting on a new platform and you have 32,000 followers on Twitter or, or 3,000, whatever, and you switch to Mastodon or Blue Sky or whatever, you see a big fat zero in front of your name 
And for a while, maybe then you have two and then maybe you have eight and it sucks. It's intimidating. It's hard. And you realize what, what you're leaving is the, is, is your audience and building an audience is incredibly hard, flat out hard. You can see it when you have a big audience on one platform and try to switch to another. It's very, very hard to bring that over. You can tell your other people come along a few percent does or do. So, um, you know, starting at zero and having numbers of zero all over the place and how many followers you have, I think is a bad idea, a really bad idea. And if I was one of these other platforms, I mean, it probably wouldn't matter because people want to know, but it's one of these, 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 uh, dead ends that you fall into. Like if you don't tell people, people like don't know, like on, Hey, for example, Hey world our, our we don't tell you, we do tell you behind the scenes, but we don't tell anyone how many people are re is reading your blog. It's just not real. We don't have analytics. We don't have any of that stuff. It's just for the, the pleasure of writing because everyone starts at a bad number, which is zero and it sucks. So anyway, I think that's another struggle that is underappreciated. And I think these other networks aren't thinking about it well enough because <laughs> you go from a few hundred or a few thousand or a few 10,000 to zero, it's, it sucks. It just sucks. Anyway, I'm repeating myself now. Which but. is what's fascinating about these metrics is that not only are they a key ingredient to what makes the platform addictive, it's a moat, a real moat. And you think like, oh, this is the internet. You can just create another account anywhere. You don't even have to pay for any of the, these platforms. There's not a payment moat, um, but the moat of the count of, of loss aversion. Hey, I had an audience. It might be small, it might be 200, but as Jason said, going from 200 to zero is still going to zero. Yeah. Well, I know you guys do not have zero Twitter followers. We will link to your handles in the show notes so people can find you. Thank you all for chatting with us all about these changes. Rework is a production of 37 Signals. You can find show notes and transcripts on our website at 37signals.com slash podcast. And as always, if you have a question for Jason or David about a better way to run your business, leave us a voicemail at 708-628-7850, and we just might answer it on an upcoming show. 